Well, a very warm welcome. It's Andrew Eborn here on a rather drizzly day here in the centre of London. We've all had Keir Starmer's speech. How are you recovering from that? Prepare for that storm. Um, we're trying a few experiments here. People have suggested, having been on more platforms than Paddington, we should be launching our own YouTube channel. We did a lot of that during lockdown and uh, I had the joy of speaking to everybody from Charles Spencer to Krista Berg to Toya, uh, lots of icons because everybody was stuck at home uh, in front of their screen and uh, chatting to Andrew for a few minutes, uh, uh, well, sometimes hours actually. I was on with Krista Berg for almost three hours and he played all sorts of glorious songs and stuff like that. Interesting times. Um, but what I love about this is that um, uh, I did a hundred shows for the brilliant uh, Mike and Jay Jenny at TNT and uh, last week uh, that particular show ended because TNT in its current form ceased broadcasting uh, guaranteed you can't keep good people down so the phoenix will be rising again uh, do watch this space in the meantime to keep us all to keep those vocal cords still well lubricated and uh, exercised uh, the suggestion was that i should pop up on here every now and again and continue uh, with the great chats with the people that we've done and to start us off what better uh, than uh, the most famous man in the world, possibly the most famous, certainly the richest, um, Elon Musk and his brilliant father, Errol Musk, uh, who I've uh, had on the show on TNT, on the Muckrakers, uh, several times. And what I love about having Errol on is that everything's so real. <laughs> he doesn't hold back. Uh, he's got some brilliant opinions on everything. But also, it's probably the closest we're going to get uh, in sort of immediate time, if you like, uh, to get uh, Errol's uh, response on behalf of Elon, if you like, in some instances, um, to all the various news stories. And think about Elon. He's got so many different companies. Everybody obviously knows X, which he bought for $44 billion, uh, last uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, interesting where that is. His plans originally were to turn that into the one-stop app, uh, rather similar to what they have in China and um, it'll be very interesting to see how that goes but X as you probably know all around the world uh, there are stories and th freedom of speech has never been in a more critical position um, we had uh, basically uh, we had the arrest of the CEO of uh, a telegram that was uh, uh, happened in France um, you have also X was closed down in Brazil it's now um, Elon's now uh, basically done a deal so he's appointed a representative paid some fines I think they're gonna be back up and running um, for their 20 plus million people in Brazil will benefit from X um, but there's a lot of concerns about liability for who should be liable for what and uh, people taking offense and we're so easy uh, for people to take offence these days. People get offended at virtually anything. Um, I'll be really grateful for your views. Do let me know. Uh, the whole idea of this is it's interactive. Um, it's a joy to have your comments and views on everything. I'll be here regularly, so do keep coming back uh, to Octopus TV on YouTube. And we're going to have all the whole back catalogue of the different interviews and various other things. And do also get in touch, because if you've got suggestions for guests, questions you'd like to ask, uh, and so on and so forth, I can get you on air. Get your questions get your voice heard that's really really important well to start you off however i'm going to play you this is a, a part of the interview this is the second part we played the first part yesterday do check that out i'll rerun that at an appropriate moment um but this is the second part of uh, the interview with errol enjoy Well, welcome back. I'm joined yet again today by uh, Errol Musk, uh, the father of Elon and several other children. You've got seven altogether, haven't you? Yes. Very good. Yes. Who's your favourite? Oh, no, they're not favourites. <laughs> the wise <laughs> answer for any father. You can never have a favourite. It's got to be good. Um, we were talking about Donald Trump and the, the the bromance, as I called it, between Donald and Elon. Now, the latest claim that uh, Donald says is that if he's elected president, which seems likely, or I think odds on, according to the statistics, uh, then what he will do is he will basically form a colony on Mars before the end of that presidential term, which he'll do with Elon. What's your take on all of that? Well, you know, that's what he's been spending billions on uh, for years now. Um, and, um, you know, uh, as with any of his early, uh, uh, the early endeavors, the, 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 the person is inclined to say to him, you know, 
give it up, you know, or, or, or perhaps you shouldn't be doing this, or why are you bothering, you know? But if you'd said that to him about Tesla, there wouldn't have been a Tesla. If you said that to him about SpaceX, there wouldn't have been a SpaceX, and so on and so forth. So, no, um, his dream is, his vision is to actually uh, have people on Mars. And, um, I mean, he's, you know, he's put his money where his mouth is all the way along. So you have to give him the credit that he's going to do what he can. He, he started Starlink, uh, as a matter of fact, which is probably the biggest, going to be the biggest IPO in, in history, um, uh, because it is... It's made up of thousands of satellites. I don't know if you know that 85% of all satellites ever launched since 1960 uh, have been launched by Elon. Right. 85% of all satellites statistic. have been launched by Elon. So, I mean, it's ridiculous. But at any rate, he's set this thing up. He, he had this idea in 2016 that if he sends up all these satellites, and, and then he, he had the idea of 60,000 satellites, but with technology improving, he's managed to do the whole thing with 7,000 satellites. So there are now 7,000 satellites up there, which they can replace or, you know, whatever necessary all the time. And they, they work with each other as like one big system. And um, and this is good. his idea was this would uh, provide Wi-Fi around the whole world, which is everybody sort of said, well, you know, give me a break. This never can happen. But it has happened. It is happening. And it is now the biggest threat to all the five optic people and the cables under the sea people and all those things that's, that's ever existed because they just don't know what to do because this is, this is going to take over. It's going to be a very much better Wi-Fi. It is already a much better Wi-Fi. It, um, it's much faster and it's going to be the very inexpensive. And next year, as Elon told me a few months ago, it will be from your cell phone. Right. So it doesn't matter where you are, it will be from your cell phone. So, um, you know, it's logical anyway. But the thing is that he did that with the idea that if he does that, he will generate his purpose for Starlink was that he could generate at the time. He said one day he thinks he could make $80 billion a year out of a Wi-Fi system like Starlink. And that was the reason he started Starlink, that it would pr provide the capital to put people on Mars, to, to provide the capital to build a system that would send people to Mars. So there's a kind of method in his madness. And... Um, so even though, even I, at this point in time, I'm inclined to say to him, you know, shouldn't you sort of just be happy with what you've achieved or something like that? I wouldn't do that. I would never say that. But, but you know, but because, you know, a, a launch of a Starship was like $2 billion, $2 right. billion. I mean, you know, you, 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 that's a lot of money. And um, all right, it goes into the system. It goes to all the workers. It goes to all the employees. It's a circulatory $2 billion. It goes back into the system. It's wonderful. And uh, it's in the financial net or fiscal net, as they say. So there's nothing wrong with it. But um, anyway, yeah, no, so, so that's what he's planning to do. And so, you know, in, in a sort of tepid way, I say, yeah, okay, we'll try it, see what we can do. Let's see how we go. <laughs> so, it, 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 I, it, it, is in, it is interesting, Harold, because in the same breath as he said, look, this is what we're planning with, with Donald Trump, he does say of Kamala Harris, gets elected, and that would basically scupper the whole project. Why is that? Yes. Well, you know, they, they, they bring in uh, regulations and they bring in uh, a kind of approach to life that is somewhat um, foreign to, to us. You know, it's the other kind of life. In other words, people who um, don't see the... Or don't. What's the right word? They, they, they don't see the forest for the trees, or whatever it is. They they only see the bad things, or they don't want to see beyond uh, themselves. You know, they don't want to uh, think um, ahead. I don't know what those kind of people are, but if they come in, they will find a reason to 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 stop it. And um, at, at the same time, of course, they feather their own nests to make sure that they are very well off in the process. They're they're bad people. And um, well, she, that's she why was, I mean, she, well, Kamala Harris was, was vice president while she's there, chair, chaired the National Space Council and advocated for space exploration. Uh, she signed 37 countries to the Artemis Accord promoting uh, peaceful space use. Uh, and she has been a, a strong supporter of space programs. Do you think it's just really the regulation side which is going to be the problem? Well, I, I'm glad to hear that about her. The Artemis uh, program was a waste of money to start with. 
it never really uh, achieved anything. It was it was a, it was lost from the start. The Boeing uh, capsule that's up on the space station, or has been up on the space station recently, is a failure. Elon has to rescue those two in February, the two astronauts. Yeah, no. Uh, the, the, what we have here is two different types of human being, and we have to sort of realize that although they may look in some ways similar, there are different different species. These are there's a different species. The species thinks differently, and uh, it, it it works differently, and so we have to look at it uh, that there's some kind of species difference. So for people in my like myself, um, I've always been fortunate. I've always been head of my class. I've always been head of things. I've always been very fortunate. As it happens, my son is the wealthiest in the world, so-called. So I could actually say I've been fortunate. Yeah. And in my my mindset is that I would take Donald Trump in, a, in an instant. I would never even remotely think of employing someone like Kamala Harris in a business of mine, I wouldn't think of it for a moment, not even for a second. No. I wouldn't be even interested in meeting her. That's whereas I'd would, I would, whereas I'd swim the Atlantic if I have actually uh, had the opportunity of saying hello to Donald Trump. But How I was it? When Atlantic. did that happen? When did that happen? Oh, listen. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I know it was years ago, but the thing is, uh, it was just, uh, he didn't know who I was, so it's no, no, no point in, in uh, I just greeted him, you know what I mean? But, um, so I, I followed his career, you see, because I was in the same sort of career in this country as he is, and that is developing rundown areas. Yes. And he developed uh, the west side of Manhattan from a rundown railway siding into the, the most beautiful buildings the world has, some of the most beautiful the world has ever seen, and certainly in America. And uh, for that, he was given nothing but a hard time by... The Democrats, they they just did everything they could to make it hard for him to, to do that. And so you have to come to the conclusion that there are two different kinds of people. There are those who seem to feather their own nests and want to prevent anyone else from going getting ahead to do anything uh, on the grounds that for some reason they think they shouldn't be doing it. I don't, I don't know why. And then you've got the other kind of people who just only see the stars. They don't see anything but... Uh, going up and trying to do the best they can. So there are these two different kinds of people. Right. And the two co different kinds of people that are going to vote in this um, American election are going to be those two different kinds of people. The one who is a, as I've noticed, a, a democratic woman will come on television or on TikTok or on Fox or something, and you'll see she's a dowdy woman with glasses could probably look much nicer, but looks awful. And that's an American Democrat female. And then along comes the presenter on Fox, and it's a blonde beauty. And you wonder what on earth she's doing presenting on TV. That's yeah. your that's your other species. That's your other one. And um, so fortunately, in my case, I'm with the blonde beauty type and not with the dowdy type. And um, I think we've all seen this, you know, Andrew, at university, and I'm sure you have, I have, when I was at university, there was, there was always that sort of crummy, that always complaining crowd, you know, they all looked dandy and they were always moaning about everything, you know, and then you had the other crowd who were always making success of everything, and the two just could never, ever mix, and that's what you've got in the world today. Yeah. You know, I look at this, um, as if I go on, this Keir Starmer, he, he doesn't look like a prime minister to me. I don't think he's a bad bloke. But he doesn't look like a prime minister to me. He looks like a plodder. He looks like Mr. Plod from the <laughs> Noddy. No, I mean, that's an insult to Mr. Plod. So, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I mean, even Boris, I, you know, every time I saw him, I thought, God, if I could get hold of this bloke, I'd comb his hair. I know. Comb his hair. You know? <laughs> but, but he had a, something about him, you know, that made you watch him. You know, yes. he's all right. 
Well, well, he, he, um, yeah, he, he always started off. I know what, what, what I, what I loved about it. He sort of started off as the, um, uh, the Carlsberg of politicians, as I would call him, uh, where basically he could reach part of the electorate uh, that that other politicians couldn't reach. He ended up with this sort of Marmite character, where, where basically you either love him or hate him. But we need personalities in the world, and Elon yes. is certainly uh, a personality, as indeed is Trump. Um, but he does have his run-ins. Everybody has his run-ins, and one of the things he hasn't done is that, that they're investing investigating at the moment about his takeover of um, uh, Twitter and, and where he got his money from and so on and so forth. And he didn't That's show really up. Bad. Yeah, he didn't what? show up for the for the um, the SEC. They want to sanction what, him what? now. What's your take Do you on blame that? Him? Do you blame him? I mean, he put together an amount of money that is equivalent to the gross natural product, if not more, of this yes. country. And he bought this thing, knowing that it's wildly overpriced. Right. And he bought this thing, knowing that it's he shouldn't be bothered with this. He should go and live in Hawaii or some nice place. Yeah. But he did this for the people of the of the of the world. You could say, quite honestly, you could say that he did that in the interests of humanity to stop these bad people from allowing, for example. All sorts of porn and child trafficking programs, uh, 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 websites on on Twitter to go ahead without any trouble. But anything that promoted um, the kind of people we like was stopped, and so he uh, uh, he he got rid of them. And having done that at such an enormous cost to himself, I mean, the interest on that money must be the vicinity of a billion dollars yeah. a year. Yeah. At least, and and um, and now he has to go and justify that he did this with all these proper people who provided him with the loans or his yes. own money. That I know he put in about twelve or thirteen million billion dollars of his own money into it. Um, he has to go and justify it to a bunch of losers, you know, and um, you know. Who's, who's, who hope, would love it to hear that he was struck by lightning on the way in or something. You know, who, 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 who go home at night and, and, and take it out on their children, no doubt. You know, the type of people I'm talking about, their, their frustrations. And, and uh, you know, those are the kind of people he's up against. Yeah. It's really difficult. I mean, just to, just to put it into into perspective, I mean, the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission, independent agency of the U.S. federal government, is creating the aftermath of the Wall Street crash oh, a... of 1929. Uh, they're supposed to protect investors from misconduct, promote fairness and efficiency in the security markets, uh, and facilitate capital formation. And um, they're investigating his 44 billion acquisition, focusing on whether he followed the law in disclosing his stock purchases and if his statements were misleading. Do you think they were? Well, you know. It was originally a good thing, the SEC, but now it's become a political body, just like the FBI, just like the CIA. It doesn't have the interests of people in the United States at heart. It has some, some special interests at heart. So you can say that with impunity because I could be sued for saying that, but that's fine because I would win in court. If it was an, a decent court, I would win because I'm right. And so... Um, they are not doing what they are purported to be doing. They're trying to make life difficult for Elon. They're trying to make TwitX suffer uh, and, 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 and give more space to uh, this hidden body that wants to put Kamala Harris in, a, a, a lady who uh, looks as though she needs to be a little bit uh, um, less on the drink or something from what I saw recently. Uh, they want to put her in as president, and um, and he's and and that's their plan. And he he's in the way. Elon's in the way. He wants people to know what's going on, and that's ridiculous. So the SEC is simply waving a flag and saying we are from the wrong side of the spectrum as far as you're concerned. We are going to bring you down. And we'll find a way. We'll find that you didn't phone so and so on such and such a day before twelve o'clock, and so on and so forth. Therefore, there's a fine involved in that, you know. And it's nonsense. Yeah. They, you know, I don't think I can say much more. But let them try. 
Let them do it. Let them try. I mean, I mean it, it, it is interesting. That's why I go back to the sort of childhood and, and the like resilience. Says, I can't make your meaning. I've got to launch a rocket. I don't, well, that's what I was going to say, because all around the world, it seems that everybody's having a pop at him with his several different companies, whether it's shutting down X, whether it's talking about the, uh, uh, the, the financial regulations, whether it's uh, fights with residents about SpaceX and so on and so forth. How does Elon cope with all of those people? Well, he's 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 got a sort of um, autistic kind of personality. I suppose that might be the word, where things sort of bounce off him a bit, you know. I mean, I remember I, I told a story about him, him getting sick over a bunch of business executives at a dinner table yes. once, I told you. And, you know, he, he was upset about it, but a few minutes after he left the dinner, he was talking to him about their dog that they had. Uh, you, know, you should clarify the age game. that he was. You did tell me. Remind me of that he's story eight, quickly. He was eight years old. Yes, he was eight, eight years old. old. It, was, it wasn't recent. You know, yes. You know, I, I said to him after this, Jesus, why did you eat that stuff that they gave? He said, well, you told me I have to eat everything. I said, well, you know, don't eat stuff you can't take, you can't eat. Anyway, he said, Dad, did you see they have a Great Dane? They have a Great Dane in that place. So he, we got to get a Great Dane. So he, he lets things bounce off him. You know, as a, as a little boy, when he was seven in grade, two, seven or eight in grade two, um, he, the, the teachers, the principal of the school phoned me and said to me that when I come in and see him, and I thought, oh my, this has got to be, of course it's about Elon, you know, so I thought, oh no, what has Elon done? And he had this habit as a small boy of telling or anyone he met who queried anything he was doing, like he, was re he used to read quite prolifically as a young boy. So if he was reading a thick book that some adult would say to him, Hey, little boy, are you really reading that book? And he would say to the adult, what, are you stupid or something? Of course I'm reading it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which didn't go down very well with a lot of adults. But at any rate, so I thought, oh, my God, he's called the teacher stupid. So I went in to see the headmaster. And um, as it happened, there was a teacher sitting in the room with, with him. And there was a t woman teacher, and she was wringing her hands. And um, cut a long story short, the headmaster said to me, look, we've come to the conclusion that Elon is retarded. So I uh, said, uh, well, I knew he wasn't retarded, you see. So I said, well, you know, why? And they said, well, this woman wringing her hands, almost in tears, the teacher, she said, well, he doesn't listen to me in class. He looks out the window all the time. And I, I can't seem to attract his attention. No matter what I do, he keeps looking out. The, and he doesn't even see me. She, he doesn't even see me, she said. And so I went to him and I walked up to his desk and, 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 and his little desk and I, I bumped him on the shoulder and he turned around and sort of woke up and looked at me and said, the trees are turning green outside. It was spring, you see, so, or something like that. And she said he was looking at the trees instead of listening to me. And so consequently, they came to the conclusion he's retarded. So um, I I saved that particular, uh, but Elon was totally nonplussed by that. When I spoke to him about it, he said, oh, no. No, the teacher, this, that, and the other, he's just worried about it. So he doesn't take it to heart, you see. And uh, going to him and say, they think you're retarded. He, no, I'm not retarded. He doesn't take it to heart. And um, actually, yeah, I mean, actually, it's, it's, in, it's interesting, Errol. I mean, you, you, you use that word, and that, that's a word that he repeated in a tweet, and again, he got uh, into trouble about it. It's all about language yeah. and so on and so forth. But it's putting it in perspective. I mean, he was labelled with that word. Is that yeah. why you think he was using it in that context? Possibly. You know, I mean, in those days, people didn't mince words. I mean, they didn't say we think he's academically channel challenged. In those days, uh, when Elon was in grade two, they said he's retarded. We think he's retarded. And that was what the normal word was, I suppose. But uh, I was able to save that thing by saying, maybe he doesn't. Oh, no, no, no. The headmaster said, maybe he doesn't hear properly. And right. I jumped on this and I said, I'm going to have his hearing tested. So that was the end of that. And we left and we had his hearing tested, nothing wrong with his hearing. And I actually moved him to another school, uh, which was, uh, which, and after that, there were no more problems. But um, no, Elon uh, doesn't, he doesn't, uh, you, you don't really uh, reach him with an insult. You know, you, you, you'd have to be uh, particularly, have some particular knowledge of weakness of some kind of weakness that he might have. I can't think of anything. But so in that respect, Kimball, on the other hand, uh, you could reduce to tears in a moment, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> how, 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 how do you reduce him to tears? Oh, he's very, he's very, um, he's a very arty, emotional guy, you know. So if you were to, you know, I mean, 
when when Elon when Kimmel got married, he was in tears, you know, at at, at the altar, you know. Right. Him, it was really serious business, crying in tears at the altar. And um, uh, Elon, of course, when he got married, of course, he just made sure all the famous names were there to to have a big wedding. <laughs> so, Which well, I mean, he, he, how how many times different. has Elon been married? How many times? Elon's been married once, I think. Okay. Twice, twice. No, he's been married twice. He's married to uh, the first one, Jonas Justine, and then to uh, to Lula. Uh, uh, he divorced her, then remarried her, and then since then he's never been married. Right. And um, and he, Kimmel's been married twice. So, okay. uh, yeah. So, and, and, uh, yeah. And, and, so, but he's had. How, I mean, and how many how many grandchildren do you now have? You've got a. It's it's, it's quite a few with I've Elon. I've got about twenty it? twenty grandchildren. Twenty. At the do, do you know all their names? Yes, of course. You know, don't ask me to run them off, but I do know their names if I see them. And um, it is difficult because sometimes when I do see them, I I suddenly have a blank, you know, and and then I, you know, have to uh, say, I just need the toilet quickly, you know, and rush to the toilet and look on my phone. You've got a little crib sheet, have you? You work on that sort of basis. (laughs) Look on my phone. But but Elon, I mean, he was with the artist Grimes, wasn't he? Then that's when he, I think it was Grimes who came up with all these sort of yes. wonderful names for the children. Was it was that well, the name? Well, it was influence? her that came up with the names. Yeah, she's. A, my daughters tell me. My daughters spend a lot of time. My two daughters say have spent a lot of time with Grimes, uh, who we call Claire, as a matter of fact, and tell me that she's a wonderful girl. Nothing like her stage persona. Right. In fact, a very down to earth, very wonderful girl, and. Um, so, uh, but I think she is actually a little bit, bit on the odd side because she wanted to put tattoos on the little boy when he was small, and Elon wouldn't have that no. on his head. In fact, oh, really? And, um, well, you know, I think they, that's they illegal. Have, they, I think it's illegal in some the one countries. Time. So at the moment, Elon's got a situation where he has custody of him. She came up with the names, and um, Elon doesn't come up with funny names like that, and. Um, uh, uh, um, we like nice names, of course, but um, um, he uh, he has custody of, of, of Zex. We call him Zex now, uh, which is not bad. It's like Xavier, you know, short. Yes, yes. Xavier, Zex, uh, and um, XEX. And, and um, so uh, he has custody of him. And at, at last uh, time, I took note of things. And uh, she's trying to get him away from her, uh, from Elon. Uh, but Elon has, of course, have given him custody because of... Uh, for the sake of the child, you know, so let's not delve into that. But um, funny, you know, the, the, the courts in America are still quite conserv- conservative family courts. Yeah. And, you know, they, they are concerned about child's well-being, you know, and, and, and so he has been able to get custody of... Right. of how how old is X at the moment? Zex is four. Four? Four, he's really four shortly. And, and Grimes wanted to put a tattoo on X? Well... He want, she wanted to tattoo his head, uh, under his hair, when he was a baby. And Elon, as I understood it, I was explained to me by my daughters that he said, no, he's not prepared to have that done. But you must understand, the art world is different. They, they are different, right. you know. Um, in my world, if you've got a tattoo, you, you're likely, unlikely to get a job in, in my type of Yeah, field. absolutely. And in, <laughs> in, you, meant, you mentioned Japan before. In, in Japan, it's uh, basically associated with the Yakuza. Uh, and and things like that. On, oh. uh, so so this is why they don't have uh, Japan tends not to have tattoos. Um, but X at that age, I mean, in, in certain countries that would be illegal. And um, what was the tattoo going to be of? Do you know? Oh, I don't know that. Well, you know, I think you know uh, they're arty people, so so they see things in from an arty point of view. And again, it's like a different species, but it's a nice species, the arty people. So a lot of the things they do are not bad. You've made a comment previously about this picture behind me and people thought the Miro, Miro was a, the Miro, I love it you know, I thought it was a nutcase now a, a Miro I mean no one can even buy a Miro you can probably buy a Belgrave Square apartment for less than a Miro you know yeah. uh, I mean you know so um well, you know, well, the picture uh, behind me, I, I knocked that up a bit early, you see. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Babel. That's the one. That's the one. Well yeah. But yeah. anyway, the thing is, so you've got the arty people and you've got to give them credit. I mean, without them, what life would be would be horrible yeah. without them. But again, in my particular sphere, I could never, you know, I'm, my sphere doesn't allow people to even be employed if they... They've got I love mom on my arm or something like that, right. you know. 
or whatever tattoo yeah, they might think like love nice. hate or whatever it is going to be on or, you know basis. something like that no no yeah. it doesn't work and and so unfortunately it's a bit lower deck you know so so tattoos are somewhat lower deck yeah. and you can't you know you can't do it do, anyway, do any of, do any of your children have tattoos no, not a single. Elon doesn't not have a, a tattoo. One. Not a single one. Nothing. Right? Nothing. Nothing. No, Elon. No. 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 The body is a temple. You know, Elon would tell you the body is a temple. So <laughs> he's a very religious guy. You know, okay. blah, blah, blah. I don't know if you know that. Oh, yeah, he's very religious. So for him, the body is a temple. So he will remind you when you smoke or something that the body is a temple. Do you know that? So you oh, do know good. That. Is that? Do you smoke? <laughs> Are you a smoker? Me? No. 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 But he will tell people. Right. You do know the body's a temple, but okay. half the time they don't know what he said, so it so it sort of goes over the head, you know. Right. But um but if somebody lights up you might I've heard him say, you know, the you know the body's a temple, you do know that, don't you? You know. And yeah. um I don't think they quite get it. But anyway, um uh, no, uh, tattoos and, and, and uh, stuff like that, no, Elon wouldn't do that. Nobody in the family's done that. Uh simply for because we aspire to uh, positions that would not look quite uh, not, would not, doesn't work sure. and admittedly you know it doesn't matter how you color it you wouldn't want to see uh, you wouldn't you'd be very surprised if you saw uh, uh, you know Keir Starmer roll up his sleeve and it said uh, uh, SSS SAS, I, I love uh, Maggie Thatcher Benova, or something yes or, <laughs> your, you know or Karl Marx was my best friend or something ah, like that there you know? go well you wouldn't be that surprised <laughs> <laughs> it, it would look rather weird you know because yeah. it's just not allowed, uh, unfortunately. But it, it, it is interesting. I mean, you talk about uh, around the world and people have different attitudes. I mean, there's a big debate at the moment about whether you should legalise cannabis, for example. I mean, what what's the family's attitude about drugs and cannabis and so on and so forth and, and the rules and regulations in place? Well, we, we're open-minded about that kind of thing because cannabis has been shown... Because in Ca Colorado, we spent many years in Colorado, they have a lot of uh, health bombs and things that you buy that are cannabis-inspired which are quite good. And and I, I was quite surprised cannabis balm put on a, a, a rash or something and away goes the rash. You know, uh, I, I have some of that uh, still from, from Colorado, which I bought in Colorado. And Colorado introduced uh, uh, cannabis uh, shops uh, about 10 years ago. So you could buy cannabis if you wanted it. And I, don't, I think they all went bankrupt because nobody wanted it when it was easy to get, you know. And... Um, but, um, yeah, no, I don't think we have any specific, none of us smoke, so we're not really uh, smokers or, or, or not to say we're opposed to smokers. I, you know, it depends on your generation. You know, my dad was a, was a chain smoker. My father, you can't help it. He, he came from the Second World War. It was, right. it was his lifeline, you know. So it depends what, what you've had to put up with, I suppose. Sure. No, and, I mean, the, um, the health benefits of, of cannabis and so on and so forth, I mean, people have spoken about yes. that quite widely, and you have CBD, and it's, it's very useful for certain conditions. What about other drugs? What's your attitude to other but drugs? But I can tell you something quite interesting. When my children were first at university in um, the United States, I was quite concerned about the uh, drug stories. Right. So when all three of them were at university, that's Kimball, Elon Kimball and Tosca. Tosca, by the way, owns Passion Flicks, which is uh, right. like Netflix. Okay, very interesting subject. Anyway, um, um, an incredibly capable woman. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get anyway, Tosca on as well. We should have, have, yes. have, have oh, them on. You should talk about that. Absolutely and beautiful looking girl. But at any rate, um, where was I? Uh, drugs. Drugs. We're talking about drugs yeah, at university. When, when, yes. they were in the when they went to university, I, I asked them um, about it. I, you know, I was concerned because they were really like little boys when they left me. You know, people have asked me when they were in South Africa. I received a question the other day. Did I try and prevent, did they leave South Africa to avoid the military? In fact, we I knew that there was going to be the military because I was a citizen, citizen force officer. I was in C, CO of a, of a squadron, in fact. But, and I knew they were li liable for that, for being up, called up. But they were little boys. So I never discussed it with them. They were little boys. They were, they were teenagers who'd seen the world. But at heart, they were still really boys, if you, if, you, if you understand what I mean. Elon left South Africa when he was 17. I mean, he was still a boy. He was a little boy. And um, so when they got over to America, I asked them about the drugs. What's the story? Is anybody coming to you with drugs to buy? And, you know, I was concerned that they might think it's a good idea or something like that. And all three of them told me this, that no one 
in all the time that this was a at least a year or so two years into their studies has ever offered them a drug in the whole time that they've ever been at university ever offered them a drug all three of them told me that dad we've never ever been offered a drug no one has ever said to us would you like the drug and i looked into it and i discovered that 90 percent of the drug problem in america at the time was in the black community and not in so much in the white high class university community if you, if you know what i mean and so um i was happy to hear that and then i subsequently had dinner with a woman who was a professor at ucla and she said to me she was a professor very smart sort of woman and at a dinner in america and she said to me i discussed the same thing with her and she said to me oddly enough whether you want to believe it or not she said i've been teaching at ucla for i don't know what the time, length of time was it's like 23 years or something i have never had to take up my self in the war against drugs i've never had to do anything about it never had to involve myself in any kind of war against drugs as a professor at ucla how must i i said oh okay cool so that's that's the b and the end of it that's a and the b or a and z of it yes. and i can add for example that with all this transgender stuff that you read about now on the media or see on the media i just spent eight weeks in the united states in texas alabama mississippi louisiana georgia you see absolutely nothing 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 whatsoever of transgenderism or or weird things going on it's it looks like the best of the best society you could ever have right now in america it's, so I, a lot of this is, 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 is yes. put on by the media yeah and, and, and that's why i always say about the media because it's it's important what, what i love about this it's you it's raw we we have a exactly that sort of side but for people who are watching this the final thought and then i'll let you get on uh, and you're, until until next time for people watching this program who are suffering with addiction or suffering because of drugs in their own family, what's the final word of advice you would give them? Well, I have the experience of uh, I married a, a, a woman whose child was uh, hooked. As a, I didn't know anything about drugs at that time, uh, who was who, who was sort of addicted to heroin, and um, it took many years. And the use of um, um, some kind of drug that was invented in Germany after the war, methadone, methadone, to take this child off the drugs and uh, re rehabilitate that person. But it took a lot of time and a lot of patience, and uh, but and and the will of the person to get off it, and to you know to to achieve that. And and so I I have in fact been in the position myself where when that particular child was desperate for heroin and I have gone and bought the heroin. I have gone into the heroin districts or the districts in the street in Cape Town at the time and bought the heroin from dealers on the street that they take the heroin out of their mouths. They have it in little packets in their mouths. They take it out of their mouths and give it to you out of their mouths and at a, at a, at a traffic light, for example, in the dark. And that's how you're able to get it. And, um, I was able to, I did that because this child needed the heroin, but it, in slowly the child was taken off the heroin so that eventually totally off the heroin. And so how, the question comes, how do they get onto heroin? And so obviously it's, uh, it's something that is presented to small, to youngsters by, uh, in, by in, in communities that are not well policed and, um, it's a problem that is 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 is, is, is I suppose everywhere. I, I I don't have a great answer to it. I, I believe Cape Town is a drug capital, uh, has been a drug capital, and I know you can buy heroin. I can go right now and buy heroin in in Cape Town, and um, so they come across the border with heroin in America. They fentanyl. I don't know anything about, and they actually kill people. With, the people die with this fentanyl stuff. And so what we're dealing with here is a policing problem, a government problem, to try and put an end to this. And I think it's a war. I mean, it's a war against drugs. Right. And unfortunately, youngsters are, are very um, are victims. They, they, they see this as a way out, I think, a way out of unhappiness uh, or some feeling of 
despair or something, say, take this, you might feel better. I've never had anyone offer me a drug in my entire existence. So I wouldn't even know. But um, but I have actually bought heroin for, for somebody to use. And um, I would say that at the time that this happened, I went to the police in South Africa and I said to them, I know who, are, who is selling heroin on the streets. They said to, said to me that they're too busy to do anything about it. I said, but you're not busy. There's a whole lot of you here and I can take you right now to the place where I can buy heroin and I can point out the people that are selling heroin on the street. They said, we're too busy. I said, but you're not doing anything. These were not blacks. They were white people in Cape Town, white policemen. And then I realized there's something wrong. And so then I was given a number to phone, which was the liaison chief of the South African police force. And I spoke to phone this person and I was given, I was told that he is a very important commissioner of some kind. And he will phone me and he will discuss it with me. So he phoned me in due course, caught me and, and phoned, uh, when I say caught me on the phone, and he had a, he spoke to me for about 30 minutes telling me all the wonderful things the South African police are doing mm. to prevent this type of thing. And I said, well, you know, I don't think you're doing enough. Anyway, it wasn't two or three months later that this commissioner was arrested on 102 counts of drug dealing. Uh, he's presently serving 21 years Oof. in the South African prisons. If he's still there or hasn't been released without anybody knowing, his name is Arno Lamour. That's his name, Arno right. Lamour, Commissioner Arno Lamour. As far as I know, he's in prison. He was the same person who phoned me to tell me that they're doing everything they can. He was found guilty on 102 counts of drug dealing. So that's where the problem lies. Yeah. And I think we, we, keep, we keep having to look at that. Um, Errol, it's, it's been an absolute revelation. A delight to have you, as always. You're coming on regularly. We'll keep unpacking those stories. <laughs> you can guarantee that the Musk family is uh, uh, the single-handedly ensuring we get great news from around the world. Uh, but for now, Errol Musk, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Andrew. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. And we're going to be having a lot more from Errol Musk uh, coming up over the course of the week. And as I say, if you've got any questions, any thoughts on any of that, then do get in touch. You can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Optimus TV. And as always, do subscribe, do like, subscribe, tell your friends, because the more that we can get people on, uh, the better. It's always a joy to have you. Um, now, every week I, I get asked by different channels to look at the newspapers. Um, and so a quick review of what's going on on this uh, glorious day. Uh, the most papers uh, today are talking about uh, Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer's party conference speech, uh, which made a number of uh, Wednesdays from Front pages. Uh, the Times pulls out his PM's vow, turn up our collar and face the storm. Well, yes, he's certainly had that over the last few days. Two-tier Keir and his free gear. Uh, what are the optics on that? And I've spoken on a number of channels about that. My biggest thing is about the hypocrisy. You'll remember that when uh, Boris Johnson and Carrie, Carrie doesn't live here anymore, according to 10 Downing Street, um, about the, uh, the wallpaper and uh, you had the headlines screaming interior resigns well all of a sudden here's Keir uh, with his free gear and, and the revelations um, the optics are not good and the reality is that as soon as uh, in the same breath you're taking away winter fuel allowance for the pensioners and then all of a sudden you're talking about thousands of pounds uh, for a pair of glasses well the reason it's thousands of pounds is so that he can see the hypocrisy of the whole thing uh, as always let me know your views on <laughs> a two-tier free gear Kia. Um, very interesting stuff. Uh, basically, that's what he's saying. Turn up our collar and face the storm. Well, interesting advice, uh, but not very helpful when you've got a choice between eating or heating. Um, also, the address is uh, basically sketched out the attempt to refocus the government after days dominated by rows over gifts and infighting at number 10. Um, what also hit the headlines, it's quite romantic really, is Sir Keir's onstage kiss uh, with his wife Victoria. That makes the splash. Um, looking uh, at the 
the Telegraph that says the Prime Minister rehashed a popular Brexit slogan as he vowed to take back control of the NHS, education and other key policy areas. What matters to you? The NHS, um, we collapsed them during COVID, uh, all the things. It, it's then gone through that sort of stage where you can't get a doctor's appointment. Uh, if you've got problems in your area, uh, let me know. But fixing the NHS, and I often say that... Uh, one of the efficiencies that we can introduce is by looking at artificial intelligence and how that can basically be used for making everything more streamlined. Uh, we have to be careful, as I say, about data, because uh, data is the new currency, and we need to look at that sort of side. Um, but sharing information uh, to basically for the greater good, and that's what AI, the artificial intelligence, is basically scraping all the different research and tools to basically come up with a solution. And there have been seismic advances in uh, basically helping the, the lame to, to walk. The people who've been paralysed uh, have basically gained that sort of stuff. Neuralink, um, Elon, uh, his, his company, uh, they're basically helping um, people to see. And phenomenal advances in that sort of side. Uh, but there is the downside. I always say that uh, artificial intelligence is our greatest human achievement, but also potentially our biggest existential threat. Uh, let me know what you think. I have lots of views on that sort of stuff as well. But that's what they're saying. Variations uh, on the phrase have cropped up in 15 times across the 54-minute speech, you know. This is a, the Brexit slogan. Take back control. Take back control. That was his little message. Um, the paper says it's a, an attempt to connect with reform voters. Well, that's interesting. The rise of reform. And I know a lot of people in the reform party, obviously Nigel and uh, Richard Tyson, I saw him at the weekend and David Bull I was a regular on his show um, Glorious uh, and Ben Habib who no longer there, interesting stuff there but they're, they're real characters and Lee Anderson as well and what's happened if you look at the voting in the last election this is the big thing. Talk about democracy. Um, you get the Liberal Dems. I predicted, I, I has always managed to get it pretty close, uh, but I predicted bang on. The Liberal Dems got about 12% of the vote and they got 72 seats. 72 seats. So many congratulations to them and Ed Davey and his interesting tactics. Um, but Reform got 2% more than that. They got 14, uh, over 14% of the votes, but only ended up with five seats. Is that fair? What does that say about our democracy? Uh, let me know. It's always interesting to hear your views. Um, Ten years to end zombie apocalypse. That's what the uh, the Metro screams. I mean, horrendous stuff uh, on, on these zombie knives and so on and so forth. Uh, the absolute ban on that. Why anybody wants to own a zombie knife uh, for legitimate purposes is beyond me. And I'll maybe hang it on the wall for artistic purposes. But anybody caught on the streets with that sort of stuff, we need to stop this. It is abhorrent. Um, Starmer's Kiss also tops the Metro. A home for every hero is the headline and a reference to Sakir's pledge to house all military veterans, uh, young care leavers and victims of domestic abuse. Home Secretary Yvette Cooper also promises to halve knife crime uh, and also gets a write-up. Uh, the Guardian, if you have a look at that, Starmer's warning of trade-offs include new prisons and electricity pylons near homes are for are the foregrounded by, uh, the, gar by the Guardian. Um, the report also uh, cites aides as saying the PM has now started to address concerns that he had been been too gloomy, too gloomy since taking office. Do you reckon he's been too gloomy? Well, I'll tell you what, he's had lots of things. One of the things I find when people are elected, you go back to what their promises were. And one of the things that resonated with me during the election campaign, and I warned about this, is when they said, we're not going to increase tax for the ordinary working person. Well, whatever that is, what's an ordinary working person? Uh, so that means they're going to look at other taxes like capital gains and inheritance tax. And we're already seeing, well, things are being slashed. So it may not be an increase, direct increase, but the money in your pocket, that's the most important thing. It's the talk about change. That was the other big theme in the election. Well, it's the change in your pocket uh, that they should be focusing on. And um, feeling better. You know, if you're looking stateside, Trump is saying to, uh, to, to the various people, the electorate, well, do you feel better today than you did four years ago when I was your president? Well, that's an interesting question. Work on that sort of basis. Um, we've also got in the Financial Times that leads on Sir Keir's promise to repair Britain and he walked sort of stark choices ahead. Um, it also features in a report on China's aggressive package of new growth measures uh, and another HSBC and JP Morgan unwittingly uh, processing payments for companies run by the late Russian mercenary uh, leader. Um, have a look at all that sort of side. These stories will 
will keep coming out. Um, but finally, we've got uh, Tough Love. That is how the Daily Mirror characterises Sir Keir's Liverpool address. Um, the Prime Minister plead to British nationals to leave Lebanon also makes the front page. Worrying times there. Um, we're living in a very diseased information age. And I always say that the first casualty of war is the truth. And what I did on the mud crakers is get lots of different voices. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with them, but it's so vital that we don't just ask the questions, but question those answers. And we need to hear different voices. I tell you what, it's been a phenomenal experience. 100 programmes I did for TNT. And because it was such a long programme, it's a whole hour dedicated to one subject, we could do a really deep dive, keep asking questions. We looked at 9-11, we looked at COVID, we looked at JFK and all those sort of things. A lot of people would dismiss those as conspiracy theories. Theories. But actually, you only need to be right once uh, with your conspiracy theory to do that. Uh, and so many revelations, things about false flags, uh, looking at those throughout history. It's a fascinating insight. I really enjoyed the journey. I will be doing more and more of those. You know, we have to continue questioning everything. I always say that I said it in my interview, uh, my wonderful chat rather, more than a, a conversation, I think, with Errol. That's the best way of putting it. Um, I say, look, if you, uh, if, if you don't read the newspapers, you're ill-informed. And if you do read the newspapers, you're misinformed. Well, we're drowning in a sea of misinformation and disinformation. And never has it been more important to question everything. Um, in 2012, I think it was, uh, the word or two words of the year were fake news, uh, epitomised by Donald as the poster boy for that. Well, last year, the word of the year was AI. Now, you combine AI with fake news, and it's a dangerous fusion, so watch out for that. And you'll know that I, I do a regular series called Fake or Fact, Andrew Ebon's Fake or Fact, where we look at stories, we look at images uh, that are out there, and videos that are out there. Because uh, they used to say the camera never lies. Well, that's the biggest lie of all. And you'll recall in the early days, of Pope uh, in a puffer. You saw those early images. Uh, and I, the devil may like uh, Prada. Well, uh, the Pope prefers a puffer. Uh, but you then had, uh, the, you know, the fake Drake and the weekend and that collaboration that fooled the world. Uh, it's getting more and more powerful. You have to question. Uh, seeing is no longer believing. It is um, perception is the greatest deception, is what I say. Watch out for that. Um, more papers then. The mail leads on the Ministry of Defence sending 700 troops to Cyprus to prepare for the possible evacuation. British nationals from Lebanon. We're living in such a dangerous time and it's working. We're on the brink uh, of, of World War Three if we're not careful. And interestingly, whatever people are saying, I, and I've asked a number of people on the show, well, who do you think could get us peace in uh, out of Biden? Well, not Biden, Harris, obviously, uh, uh, but Harris, if she were to be elected, and, and Trump. And a lot of people are basically saying, well, they're more likely that Trump will get us peace because the world leaders around uh, around everywhere, you know, in China, in uh, in Russia, in uh, in North Korea, they're scared of Trump because he's a bit unpredictable. Uh, again, let me know uh, your views. Uh, the I, the I is talking about uh, uh, basically the EU is prepared to shorten the time it will ask Sir Keir government, uh, Sir Keir's government to allow under 30s to remain in the UK for uh, uh, basically according to uh, the I. So how long can these under 30s remain in the UK for? Uh, well, that's what they, they're prepared to shorten that. The paper says it's possible deal with Brussels could help unlock new agreements with Europe on security and trade. So Brexit, get Brexit done was Boris's mantra when he was uh, for that particular election. Is Sir Keir's get Brexit undone? Again, let me know your views. And is that what you wanted? Because uh, again, this now he's back in power. That's him. A good positive one um, in the uh, the Daily Express. Kate back at work uh, to prepare for Christmas concert. The Princess of Wales showed her determination to return to work. The Daily Express reports uh, as she set about planning a Christmas concert on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, they tend to get these Christmas concerts earlier and earlier. I remember um, doing a lot of TV shows where they basically record their Christmas specials in the in, in the summer, and it's quite funny seeing these Christmas trees up. Uh, but we celebrate Christmas every day virtually. Um, anyway, there's a glorious photograph on on the paper uh, of Catherine, Prince Louis, and Princess Charlotte attending a royal carol service at Westminster Abbey in 2023, and she's accompanied uh, basically accompanies that story. The Princess 42 has taken some time away from public engagements, was undergoing treatment for cancer. Uh, and horrendous, there will be people watching at the moment who have loved ones or made themselves 
be suffering from uh, cancer or other illnesses. Uh, to have to do that in the public eye just adds to the difficulty. So our, our thoughts are obviously uh, with there as well. Um, the Sun leads on exclusive, not a very flattering picture, but uh, uh, Phil, I'm back, he says. Um, after On TV, 16 months after sacking, he opens his heart on Survival Show. Well, uh, this is the survival. Basically, the Sun reports on Philip Schofield's TV comeback 16 months after he left ITV's This Morning programme. Um, the paper says Mr Schofield has filmed a one-man survival show for Channel 5. Well, I can tell you, I saw that show when I was down in Cannes at the TV market. I go to that every year, or twice a year, actually. We have one in March, April time called MIP, and then we have another one in October called MIPCOM. And every year I present uh, the Drama Awards down there. It's glorious with Lily Ono and the wonderful Japanese uh, team there. Uh, brilliant team it is, uh, and I really enjoy doing that. Uh, so I'll be presenting the Drama Awards. Um, but I saw this particular show that uh, that Philip Schofield uh, was on. It was, uh, as I say, it was recorded some time ago, actually. So I was, I was there in, in March and saw that. Um, this is going to be for, it's a one-man survival show for Channel 5, in which he will discuss the period since he admitted to having an affair with a younger co-walker. Uh, Philip's back. What's your views on that? Uh, is is that something? Is it right that he should be back? Should everybody be given a second chance? Um, also, the Daily Star. The Daily Star never ceases to provide glorious stuff. Nessie reveals a wicked sense of humour as she plays pranks on bo boaters. Boo, it says. Uh, Loch Ness Funster. Uh, apparently what they say, there's a, a father and son were claiming to have been attacked. Attacked, but no less, by the Loch Ness Monster while out canoeing. And both Jeff Potts and his son Chris say they felt something strike their vessel from below. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> the paper asks. Ah, oh, they come up. The pun is mightier than uh, the sword. Um, the other thing I should say, uh, glorious things as well, is uh, what's going on. We have um, a number of things as a special. Uh, uh, many years ago, I released a, a book called The Book of Failure, Andrew Eborn's Book of Failure, got to remember it's mine. Um, and this was a series of articles which I did for an industry publication called uh, The Drum. And everybody writes books about success, but very few people write books about the failure that led to that success. So basically, I, could, I was commissioned to do a series of articles. Um, it was turned into one book, and it's now in its second edition with a foreword by my good chum, uh, Mike Reed. Um, as a little celebration, I put a link in the title below. Um, there's just a couple on eBay for virtually next to nothing. Uh, uh, those who are quick, fastest finger first, uh, will get a chance to get a copy of those. Go and get one now and uh, get, get a couple. They're very rare, unsigned copies, rare unsigned gobbies um, in its in second edition the Andrew Eborn Book of Failure uh, a shameless plug um, and speaking of shameless plugs uh, do subscribe to Octopus TV uh, do follow me at Andrew Eborn and do let me know your suggestions as to guests and anybody else uh, you think would be great to have on the show uh, I'm here all the time uh, we're looking forward to uh, all of that um, but for me for now uh, thank you very much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you uh, next time do as I say do subscribe I'll be back again tomorrow we're going to play more of uh, the Keir interviews not the Keir interviews <laughs> oh do that as well you know he's very welcome we could get him on what do you reckon what are the, what are the questions that you would ask Keir Starmer uh, let me know also let me know uh, what what's your basically turn around and uh, anything you want to ask Errol and we can make that make sense as well. Um, it has been such a joy. Thank you so much for your patience as uh, we work out all the wonderful technology, uh, work out, get those hamster wheels uh, spinning as fast as we possibly can. Any tips that you've got on the lighting and stuff like that? Any tips as to contents? Any any thoughts? Because I know a lot of people are sitting at home and they're doing their own uh, podcasts. They're doing their own other, other bits and pieces. I will continue on more platforms than Paddington. I've had the joy of, I was on Times Radio uh, this week. We've done the BBC. See, we've done my, our good friends on both sides of the rivers in Paddington and also in London Bridge. So uh, continue doing that around the world. Uh, but also there's an extra platform here. And the idea, as I say, this is going to be your voice. Uh, I want to hear from you. Uh, I've been Andrew Eborn. You've been great. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, next.